Check, check, check. Hello. Hello. Hey, everybody can hear me in the back, in the front? Everything good? All right. Uh, so let's get this started. Uh, I know that I'm the last stop today before beer, so I'll make sure to stick to a lot of time because uh, uh, I'm as excited about the beer as you are, so things are good. Uh, my name is Rusty Klopphaus. I'm a senior software engineer at Basho Technologies. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about a React search, a full text search and indexing engine based on React and also complementary to React. So the three things I'm going to uh, talk about uh, for this talk, uh, it's three parts. First, why did we build React Search? Second, what are the major goals of React Search? And third, how does React Search work? So first, how did we, or why did we build React Search? So to understand uh, why we built React Search, you need to understand a little bit about React itself, which is the, uh, at this point, the core product of Basho Technologies. So React is a scalable, highly available, networked, open source, key value store. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a Dynamo clone with some extra things built onto it. Um, if you're not familiar with a key value store, a very quick introduction, uh, you basically write a key in a value. It's, uh, it's not very uh, complicated there. Uh, in React, we call this an object, because along with that key and that value, we store a little bit of metadata uh, around the object itself. Um, and to query the key value store, you pass in the key, and the key value store gives you back the object. Again, it's a pretty simple access model. So, so this is the first sort of access pattern that I'm going to talk about. The second access pattern that we have, or query pattern, is uh, you can actually do something called link walking. The idea behind link walking is that you have uh, a bunch of different objects, and you set a parent-child relationship from one object to the other. Um, then at query time, what you can actually do is pass in the key, as well as some instructions on how to walk through those links. And those instructions are actually executed in parallel on the server, so on the cluster itself. Uh, and React will, will walk through to all the related keys that you've instructed it to and give you back the list of objects. So it's a nice sort of um, quasi-relational way to get back your data. Uh, the last query pattern I want to uh, sort of introduce here is the idea of MapReduce. In other words, React has this uh, functionality where you can uh, pass in a set of starting keys as well as some JavaScript map and reduce functions. Um, and then those, are, those map and reduce functions are actually executed in parallel on the server again. Uh, and it gives you back a computed value. And what's nice about this, you can sort of think of it as a mini Hadoop. Uh, this map and reduce, and reduce operation is actually happening sort of in web time, in real time, uh, on your data. So the reason I'm talking about these different um, key value store type patterns is because uh, they're all key-based. In each one of these, you provide the key plus maybe some stuff, and you get back your, back your objects. But the question is, what happens when you want to query your data uh, in some other way? What happens if you want to query it by value? So if you want to get all of your data where category equals shoes, uh, basically, React says, yeah, I'm not built to do that. I have no idea what you mean. Uh, taking that a step further, what happens if you want to answer some sort of a full text query? Uh, where you want to get everything where the description of your object is converse and shoes. Again, React, not going not gonna to be able to handle that. But as we see people build more and more applications on top of React, a key value store, uh, even though they start building their applications in a very key value oriented way, uh, eventually many people, if not all people, run into the situation where they say, man, I, I really need an index. I really need to be able to query my data in this different way. Um, we see a problem. We see an opportunity to solve it. So that, for us, is an opportunity to bring another product uh, to the market and, and, and frankly, on to, uh, to hack on something new and interesting. So, all right. So that's uh, sort of why we built React Search. The next question is, what are the main goals of React Search? Um, Again, looking at the way most people use React at this point, the key value store, uh, they generally have some application, and it's built on top of React, and it's sort of built in this very uh, key value store-ish type way, for lack of a better term. But uh, basically, there's not going to be much of an impotence mismatch. They've sort of structured their application around a key value store. Um, React uh, is going to store your data in some sort of uh, very scalable, uh, clustery way, which means that you can add machines to it and everything, and you know, the node rebalances to all the machines in the cluster. What this means is that you can, score, or you can uh, scale your, your, um, your data store independently of your application layer, 
Uh, and because all of your data is in the data store, you can basically scale them as you need to independently, which is a very nice thing. But eventually, as I said, the customers say, well, I'm doing some sort of operation here, and I need an index. And generally, the first thing we counsel them to do is to actually build their index in React itself. Uh, so going back to the shoes example, what you might do is every time you write a shoe object to the data store, you would also fetch some other object, update it with that new shoes object or the, or the key pointing to that new shoes object, uh, and then write that back to the data store. So you're just maintaining this thing sort of independently. Um, but eventually, that becomes too simplistic of a model, and people need something a little more uh, featureful in order to build their applications on. So the first thing that we recommend is that people use Lucene, because it's something people know, and it's a very, you know, as we've heard today, a lot of talks about it, it's a very high-powered index. It does a lot of things well. Um, one thing it doesn't do well, and people are starting to do some work around, is getting Lucene to run on multiple computers. Um, so as you can see here, if you put just a single instance of Lucene between your application and React, you run into a problem. The first problem is that React itself is going to be running on multiple computers. And the reason you generally want to do that, you want to scale out, a lot of times it's because you have more data than can fit on a single computer. Um, so if you've got you know, a, a React cluster of 10 computers over here, 10 servers over here, and you're trying to serve all that or answer all the, the queries to that cluster with a single server of, of Lucene, um, you know, first, you're just going to have too much data that will fit on a single machine. machine. So there's an easy way to get around that problem, you shard. Uh, so here we have three different Lucene instances, and we're sharding the documents to all of those. Um, and now we can fit all of the data that we need to on Lucene, right? But now we still have two more problems here. First, uh, where in, uh, in this slide we've created a single point of failure. In this slide we have created three single points of failure, so we're three times as likely to fail if one of these Lucene nodes goes down and we won't be able to answer the queries to have our application run and to get to our data. Um, second, we've created this um, sort of single stream conceptually from our application to our data. Uh, and what this means is that we've got a bottleneck. So all of these things are going to have to, uh, you know, any query is going to have to hit Lucene or these three instances of Lucene before it can read from, from React. That's pretty easy to solve. Again, we replicate, so maybe have some masters and slaves. So now we have three partitions, three replicas. We've got three times the fault tolerance, uh, three times the data storage capacity. Um, but there's a big problem with this as well in that it just turns into an operations nightmare. Um, and we've, we've heard from a lot of people that are trying to solve this. And I, I, I guess uh, from, from this standpoint, we're another, uh, another group that's trying to solve this problem. What we really want to do here, or what our customers really want, is a reoccupied Lucene. In other words, they want something that's got the front end of Lucene, that supports Lucene syntax and Lucene queries and solar endpoints, um, but they want the operations story of React. So to be able to stand up new nodes, have the data balance, uh, a node goes down, the cluster continues to run, all of the nice things that people like about React operationally. And that is the sort of sweet spot of React search. So just a quick review. Um, functionality, again, the goal is to be like Lucene, uh, offer Lucene syntax. Uh, we actually leverage the Java Lucene analyzers. Uh, they're, they're already built. They're great. There's no need to reinvent the wheel there. Uh, we expose solar endpoints for select and update. Um, there's integration via React post commit hooks. Um, uh, essentially, what this means is that index time, if you're already using React, um, then React will talk to React search uh, directly. You don't need to do anything extra. Um, you can use that instead of your solar endpoint if you want. Um, and I'll clarify, there's no reason that you need to be running React to use um, React search. It's just they, they integrate very tightly and nicely if you need them to. Um, there's integration via React MapReduce, which means that uh, if you recall back to that MapReduce example that I showed earlier, um, as one of those map phases, or as one of the phases in your operations, you can actually expand a query into a bunch of uh, objects that you then operate over before returning your result. Um, React search uh, is near real time. In other words, uh, when you put data into it, you get that data back in a very short amount of time, generally less than a second. Uh, that new data is reflected in results. 
Uh, and finally, the data is schemaless. Uh, in other words, you can, I'll say this, you can operate it without a schema if you want to. You can also provide a schema to do some more interesting things around your data also if you want to. From an operation standpoint, uh, as I said, the goal is to make this like React. Uh, so in other words, there are no special nodes, no master nodes, uh, no slaves, no name servers. Uh, all nodes are, are equal and homogenous, uh, which means if one goes down, uh, React search continues to run. If you bring another one into the cluster, uh, the data is automatically um, uh, handed off to that new node, and things continue to run faster with more capacity. Um, uh, there are replicas for durability and performance, just like in React. Uh, you can index and query in parallel uh, at the same time, and those indexes and queries are, are conducted across your entire cluster. And finally, React Search uses swappable storage backends. Uh, so if you have certain data of certain types, um, you can store it on a different backend uh, than you might otherwise normally store it on. And it also lets us sort of experiment with different storage mechanisms. All right, so part three, how do we do this? And this is where things get uh, sort of interesting and fun. Uh, first, what I'm going to do is start with a gentle introduction to document indexing. Uh, basically, um, here's how most document indexes uh, written today work. Uh, the basic idea is you're going to take some sort of document. Uh, this is a common idiom in, uh, in America. Every dog has his day. Um, and we're going to break that into an inverted index. And to do that, we just take, uh, we're going to sort of do some normalization on the document itself and break it into the words. Uh, and then the inverted index is going to consist of a number of postings. And each of the po a posting is basically a line on there of where we're going to have the term and the ID. Um, if we have multiple documents, or I guess when we have multiple documents, uh, we're going to put those into a combined inverted index. So we're going to do the same thing for the documents over here. And we're going to break them up into their terms, normalize those terms, and then store them somewhere, and we'll get to that later, um, in this combined inverted index. And as you can see, we're basically sorting the terms and then sorting on the document IDs underneath those terms. And this lets you do uh, queries very easily. Say you want to get all of the documents with the word dog in them, it's easy to say, well, you do a binary search or somehow get to the point in your, in your inverted index where dog is listed, and then you can just look and say, okay, well, we know documents one, two, and four have the word dog in them. So the question is, how are we going to use this for some more advanced things, uh, for answering a query like dog and cat? This query is going to break into the graph you see below. It's going to have an and operator, as well as a dog and a cat term. Um, and then at query time, what we're going to do is look at that inverted index. Again, we're not sure where it's stored yet, but we're just uh, trust that it's there. And we're going to load the part of it, the portion of it for dog, and the portion of it for cat. And then since these documents are in sorted order, what we can do is actually do a merge intersection over these. So it's just going to be like a normal intersection, except what we're going to do is sort of uh, think about having a pointer sort of at the head of each of these lists. And we're going to compare the two sides uh, and basically toss out whichever one is lowest. And by continuing to do that until we see them both be equal and only taking the ones that are equal, we've done a merge intersection. Um, an OR operation is going to work much the same way. Uh, instead, of, uh, instead of doing an intersection, we're actually going to do a merge union. And we're basically just going to take both lists, union them together, and toss out any duplicates. So those two structures, the AND and the OR, and a NOT, which you can sort of surmise is going to work much the same way, uh, can lead to some very complicated things that unfortunately you can't really read uh, because this is blown up so high. But trust that in each one of these boxes is some information about a different term that's feeding into uh, some AND operators and some OR operators. Uh, and basically, this is what a complex query graph looks like uh, when we've parsed it through, you know, through a parser and created this graph. This is what it's going to look like to actually run our search operation. So the question now is, uh, we sort of know the shape that we want of React Search, and, and we know um, what sort of data we need to be able to answer queries. And we're going to need this inverted index. Um, the question is, how are we actually going to store this data? Um, so as I said before, uh, React is built on and sort of complementary to uh, React itself. Uh, so because of that, we're going to use consistent hashing to store data on partitions. 
a quick introduction to this. Um, if you're familiar with the Dynamo paper, this will be a review. If you're not, uh, hopefully this sort of sets you up for the next couple of slides. Uh, the idea of consistent hashing is that you're going to take some sort of a key, and you're going to map that key to a very big integer space, going from 0 to you know, 2 to the 64th or 128th power, or something extraordinarily large. Uh, and the idea being that you want to be able to hash that key um, in a way uh, to some sort of integer that you'll very, very, very unlikely ever have a collision on. Um, once you have that hash value, the integer, you're going to picture that being on a giant clock or a ring, you know, starting at 0 and going all the way around to the last number in that, in that consistent hash. Um, you're going to take that ring and divide it into basically pie chunks. Um, divide it into equal segments that we call partitions or v-nodes. Um, in this case, we've got this ring here. Um, we have 10 different partitions. Uh, and then we're assuming that we have five different nodes. So what's going to happen is that each node is going to claim two of these partitions. Uh, if, a node, if, a no, if a node would, uh, would drop out of this, then um, some of the other partitions would claim those, uh, parti or some of the other nodes would claim those partitions back. Um, and if we were to add a node to this, then that new node would claim some of the, some of the partitions as well. Um, and finally, what we're going to do here is we're going to store two replicas of our data. So what that's going to look like is if we're storing some sort of an object, um, we're going to take the key of that object, find the place on the ring where that object should be located, uh, which is that green partition there, and then we're going to store the object on that partition plus the very next partition. So that's how we have our replicas. OK, so switching to a different version of partitioning here. This slide's a little confusing. Um, we, we know at this point uh, that we've got an inverted index. And we know that we want to store it using uh, our, our, um, our Dynamo-style partitions and consistent hashing. The question is, how are we going to actually partition our documents? Uh, and, and here I'm using the same partitioning as people talk about when they're saying, well, we're going to take the document and put it in a specific shard. How, you how do you decide where to partition that document? And do you partition it at the document level, where you take the entire document and put it somewhere? Or are you going to partition it at the term level, where you're going to take that document, split it up into something, and then put those things somewhere? Um, and React Search is using term partitioning. But uh, before getting into the trade-offs, I'm just going to describe the two here. Uh, so document partitioning. And, and one side note, this is, um, I, uh, I guess, two talks ago. Um, was the uh, Elasticsearch talk. This is probably the biggest differentiator between what we're doing and what they're doing. Um, they are doing a, 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 di a document partitioning approach, which is this approach. We're doing a term partitioning approach, which is the next approach that I'll get to. Um, all right, so document partitioning. Uh, as I said, the idea is you have some document. Here we've got the document, every dog has his day. Uh, and based on the document number, which is document number one, we're going to figure out the partition where that should go and then write it to that partition plus the very next partition. So this makes the index time operations that you need to do very, very simple. You just write to where the document should go. At query time, you've got a slightly different story, though, because you don't know which partitions might hold the document with which terms. When you're given a query, you basically need to go hit uh, all of the partitions, or at least all of the partitions that might hold that document. Uh, so here, we're hitting every other partition because the replica is two. Uh, in something like Elasticsearch, uh, this would be, you know, if you have sort of replicas, you'd only really need to hit one of those replicas to figure out uh, where um, to, to, to answer that query. Um, the other approach to doing this, as I said, uh, so this is document partitioning. The other approach is term partitioning, where what you're going to do is take that document, and you're going to break it up into the different terms, uh, so into your, your inverted index or your postings file here. And then when you write this, so this is at index time, you're actually going to run your consistent hash on the terms itself. So for example, dog is going to be in those two partitions up there, every is going to be in the two partitions down here, uh, and so on. So this means that you've got a little more complicated story of things that you need to do at index time. But at query time, it looks very simple. Uh, because uh, basically, uh, you know exactly where all of the postings for the word dog are going to go, and you know exactly where all of the postings for the word cat are going to go, and you can run a query just by hitting those two partitions. So the trade-offs here um, are, are like this. Um, 
Well, I'll, start, I'll actually start at the bottom. If you remember during the document partitioning phase, at query time, you had to hit everything. The problem with that is every time you're hitting a partition to try to answer that query, uh, you need to do some sort of a disk seek, or at the very least, some sort of a network access to that partition. Um, and that's going to lead to a lot of overhead for each query. Um, uh, conversely, in term partitioning, if you're answering a query such as dog and cat, all you need to do is hit the partition that's known to have dog in it, and the partition that's known to have cat in it, and then you've answered that query. So it's basically you know, a whole bunch of, well, if you have 64 partitions, that's 64 network accesses and, and, and F-seeks versus two if you're using term partitioning. Um, what this means from a performance standpoint is that document partitioning, uh, in general, your queries are all going to be lower latency. It's going to be much quicker to answer any individual query, which is a good thing. And, and, uh, and you can sort of look at this as like uh, if you've got an army and you're telling them to dig a bunch of holes, if you tell the entire army to dig a hole, that hole is going to get dug very, very quickly. But you can only dig one hole at a time, or fewer holes at a time. Um, so, so document partitioning will have lower latency, but also lower throughput, fewer holes dug overall. Term partitioning, on the other hand, each query is going to have slightly higher latency, um, because now instead of having the entire army digging a hole, you've got uh, maybe two or three guys, uh, and all of them, you know, you've, you've split your entire army into groups of two and three, and all of them are digging holes at the same time. Um, so your queries are going to be a little higher latency because it's going to be harder for two guys to dig a hole. But on the other hand, um, you'll get higher throughput. Overall, you'll get more holes dug at the same time. Um, the one big problem with term partitioning, though, and the problem that, we, that has you know, really been the difficult part to solve on this and the part that we're still working on, frankly, is hot spots in the ring. Um, and internally, we call this the Obama problem. Uh, the basic idea is that you have, if you have a lot of documents that all have the same term in them, um, the postings for all of those documents are going to go to the same partition. And whichever partition is holding the word Obama in it is going to explode in size because you have so many documents in it, or so many postings in it. Um, so as I already mentioned, we're using uh, term partitioning. Basically, the optimizations that we're doing to try to get around that or to alleviate that uh, is we, t we detect if that problem is starting to occur. Uh, and we do things like term splitting. So we'll actually take Obama and rewrite it into, uh, conceptually, we'll, we'll split it into Obama 1, Obama 2, Obama 3, and we'll, we'll sort of munge uh, both, the, um, both the term itself and the query in order to get around that problem and break, the, um, break that partition or that term uh, up into multiple different partitions. Um, some other things we're doing uh, in, f in terms of optimizations, um, use bloom filters uh, in order to optimize queries and caching in order to avoid running queries altogether. Um, batching to save query time and index time bandwidth. Uh, you know, if you recall back to the slide of, uh, of term partitioning index time, basically where we're writing all of the things all over the data store, if you can start to batch those up, it, it means fewer, uh, you know, less chatty network access so you can make things faster. Um, that said, this is really, uh, you know, what, what I just described to you is really sort of the big endian, little endian uh, sort of conflict in all of distributed indexing. Um, there are papers written basically monthly saying one is better versus the other is better. There's no real right answer here except uh, it really depends on the shape of your data. Um, so eventually we're hoping to support uh, the other style of partitioning, which is document partitioning as well. Um, but this just sort of gives you a uh, a view into this, the problem of distributed search and, and sort of how we're going about solving it. Um, so I'm almost out of time. I think I'm at a, yeah, almost out of time here, so just a quick review. Um, React search turns this, a query that React cannot answer, into something that React can gladly answer. It will give you back your keys and objects, um, while at the same time keeping operations uh, as easy as operations are in React itself. Um, all right, and that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, oh. Cassandra, are you aware of this mixture of Lucene over Cassandra? Basically, the same ar architecture. Um, actually, I'm, I, I haven't looked into it at all, so I'm, oh, I'm not sure. Okay, then um, that's it. But I will. Thank you for the question. Everybody wants beer that badly, all right. <laughs>
Regarding Lucina and uh, API, uh, what kind of, uh, the, which parts of the Lucina API you implement? Uh, and is it really compatible with uh, Lucene Java API? Uh, so, that's, so that's a good question. Um, the, we basically support uh, all Boolean operators at this point, uh, as well as range searches, uh, as long as the ranges are, are um, basically, well, I won't get into all that. R range searches with slight limitations. Um, uh, Wildcard queries, but only with wildcards at the end, uh, as well as you know, the question mark queries, but only if they're at the end. Um, uh, basically working on date support at this point and working on facet support at this point. An additional question, because uh, you mentioned uh, solar endpoints, but yes. the, they just mimic uh, the, the solar behavior, right, without uh, actually implementing the same functionality. Correct, yes. So, it's, so we're basically trying to make it so that um, you know, within reason, if you are already using uh, solar for your application, uh, that you can switch out solar without too much work and just put in React Search uh, and have it have it work. So. Thanks. Um, that said, there there are no. Uh, it's it's sort of like um, uh, Elasticsearch in this point. There are no real commits. It's sort of uh, you know when you when you index a document, that document is is indexed. There's no sort of do some stuff and then commit, and then do some stuff and then commit. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Okay, if I have a distributed by documents and I search for two terms and they are one million times each term, but mm. together there's only one document, mm. it will be fast. In, in your case, you put one million, is it a bit set? What do you, what, what's this way to put one million with another million over HTTP, or <laughs> what is the way? Um, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, at this point, we're hoping to get some of the gains back through Bloom filters, uh, so be able to take, uh, you know, if you keep a, a Bloom filter on each of the, on each of the distinct uh, term sets, then you can actually just send the Bloom filter over, mm -hmm. um, and then you, you know you can do all your filtering on the local node. I mean, you, at some point you need to look through the data, right? So you you know you're not going to be able to, you know, you can save the network traffic, but you still need to do sort of the crunching somewhere. So you need to know something about your data. Oh. Or takes a right bloom filter for that. Oh, uh, yes, a little bit, but the, but you know, all that all of that is done uh, automatically. Uh, so the idea is, we're, you know, we're keeping track of, you know, you, you will need to estimate probably at some level, you know, estimate the number of ter or number of results for a term you expect to get to be able to size your bloom filter appropriately. But, uh, but yeah, all the otherwise it should be automatic. Yeah. All right, I, th I think that's it. I don't see any other hands going up, so thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. <laughs>